get to, and it comes back to you, Raphael. Um, I love my microscope. It's sitting in my office and I use it. And so I'm gonna challenge the concept that has uh, been thrown out that this molecular profile will someday allow us to diagnose these diseases. So my question really is, just how specific is, are these mutations that we're finding or panel of mutations that can distinguish, can they distinguish MDS from lymphoma or yeah. another cancer? No, that's a great point. I think we will always have some role for the microscope because these mutations have to be interpreted in a certain context. They have to be interpreted in light of the patient's blood counts, in the light of what types of cells are actually the malignant cells in the bone marrow. Many of the mutations we find are not restricted to MDS. The mutations can be found in AML, mild proliferative disorders, and even in lymphomas, like you mentioned, some of the most frequently mutated genes like TET2 and DNMT3A really span a gamut of different diseases. And if you just know that those mutations are present, you don't have a diagnosis. You really need to look at the tissue to find out. Nonetheless, um, while I too have a microscope in my office and love it very much, uh, trying to make sense of RAB1 versus RAB2 Please, uh, it, it's been too long uh, and um, we need to move on from that. Yes, so in the context of the disease that's defined, then these are clearly gonna be helpful. But I, I worry about um, what do we do with a patient who comes in with just cytopenias, the marrow does not rise to the level of showing morphologic dysplasia, there's no cytogenetics, and you've happened to send off to one of your reference labs this genomic testing, and one gene is mutated at some low frequency. Do we know what to do with that? Well, that's an area of active investigation, something we're very interested in actually running clinical trials on. My, my take on this is that right now, if you look at the World Health Organization criteria, there are certain cytogenetic abnormalities that count as presumptive evidence of MDS. And the reason that they're there is because they tend to be found more often in MDS compared with other myeloid disorders. There are certainly gene mutations that fit that profile. The splicing factor mutations are great examples. They're much more enriched in MDS than they are in AML and, and CMML and than they are in things like MPDs, other than that. So I think if you found one of those mutations in a patient who had mild cytopenias, maybe some mild dysplasia that didn't quite meet criteria, to me that would be presumptive evidence of the diagnosis. How these patients do, we don't know yet. We haven't studied them going forward but they would certainly raise my index of suspicion for this case. But Raphael, for the community physicians, like we do it in our centers, we check the uh, mutation panel every three months, but in a community setting, do we need to check for these tests? I, I think uh, in not, a, every not in everyone. I don't, think, I don't advocate doing that in every single case. Uh, mutation testing can be done, I think, in two different scenarios. One is the, the exact case that you mentioned, a patient who has an uncertain diagnosis, and there a broad panel is useful because if you find a mutation in any one of those genes, you have evidence of a clonal disorder. It's not their B12 level, it's not their autoimmune disease, it's some sort of neoplasm. The other setting that I find it useful is a patient who has a defined diagnosis of MDS, and you have some uncertainty about their prognosis. So there is a smaller subset of genes, a much smaller panel, that would tell you something about how that patient is likely to do, and that might inform your decision to send them to transplant, for example, or to start therapy versus simply observe them. And I think this concept that you raise of this pretest probability. I mean, you know, are you really trying to hunt down the cause for the cytopenia is, is so essential. Because I think as we have increasing number of panels and you have cross uh, presence of mutations that are unexpected, let's say you find a mutation that might be associated with pancreatic cancer. You know, I mean, trying to put these things in context, I think is gonna be uh, increasingly a, a challenge. So I think it has to be that clinical phenotype of concern the histology, and then really guiding the utilization of the markers. But I, but I do think for today, you know, for, for most patients with MDS, although we can gather that, uh, that uh, information, it still is difficult to apply. So I'd like to flesh that question, that point out, the point that you made, Raphael, a little bit more. So you've published a, a very nice data in over 400 patients with myelodysplastic syndrome, a signature of five genes that predicted a worse outcome. And the predictive value of that signature was best defined in the low-risk patients um, according to IPSS. So I'd like to get the panel's discussion on this. Should clinicians um, viewing you, viewing this, be ordering this test, and if it comes back showing a high-risk feature, uh, molecular feature, refer those patients to transplant or start them on therapy based on that data alone. Do we have any data, or, do, or what's your opinion? 
I, why don't you start? I, I think it's still, again, work in transition. I don't think we know that clearly. I think there are two ways we can think of this. First is prognostically. We definitely know probably that prognostically we can discuss with the patients that their disease looks like a higher risk. And I think looking at what Rafael published, uh, even supplementing the newer clinical models with those molecular tests, you will upstage somewhere between 20 to 30 percent integrating the newer risk models and the molecular data. So somebody we assumed in the past had lower risk, several years of survival, that will change. So from prognostic value, I think we are a little bit more comfortable saying, yes, this is prognostic. In terms of using those tests to tailor therapy, I think that's where we are a little bit hesitant or reluctant yet. So even if you use a clinical model, if you use revised IPSS and somebody came higher risk, do we recommend for this patient to go to transplant? Uh, do we recommend something different? We don't have much evidence yet. We tried even you know, in our database to look at those and we saw some survival advantage for applying therapies like allogeneic transplant or hypomethylators in this group, but this is very biased kind of way of looking at it because the, the indication to treat patients was not, was not the risk of disease. This is retrospective review. Uh, so, as we move on, I probably will use them maybe to tailor therapy, but we are not yet there. But, you know, in certain cases, yes, it could be. There was like intermediate revised IPSS group that we are talking about that now the guidelines say you could go higher risk, lower risk, and you get another mutation that, you know, it's bad. Patients in the younger age, probably you'll start having discussions about something like transplant with those patients. I think that's a good example. The, the IPSS revised has five categories and the intermediate group in the middle really could be on either side of that higher versus lower risk disease. And if you had additional markers, whether they be an elevated ferritin or an elevated LDH or a molecular marker that pushed you towards more aggressive disease, you might lump them together in that higher risk group. What I would love to see is a clinical trial where we take these predicted to be low risk patients that have adverse mutations and see if they actually do better with therapy. Because it may very well be that these same mutations that predict bad disease also predict resistance to treatment. So there is no guarantee that treating them early would necessarily result in better outcomes. But they do change, I think, at least your index of suspicion, your, how much you observe them for in terms of progression and things like that. They change my behavior, at least. 